Hello, and thanks for joining us on Universal Heritage Television, Niger. We are bringing you another interesting package in our program called Matter of Concern. A Matter of Concern program mirrors the issues in the society, whether they are political, economic, or social. We have a guest today to look at one or two issues. He is Professor Hilary Ekemam. He is a former lecturer in, in the Imo State University, Department of uh, Political Science. Prof, you are welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. And I must have to add, add that uh, Professor Ekemam is a community leader. He is the President General of Isiogwa Development Union, as well as a political and research uh, consultant. Prof, once more, you are welcome. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Now, my name is Afam Echi, your host. Remember to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube platform. We are going to talk about two major issues that dwell on famine and uh, the issue of a uh, glut of women, marriageable women in our society. Um, if you remember, this is the famine period, and um, it's expected that, uh, as is typical with uh, an Igbo environment, Igbo society, every hand should be on deck, famine. Prof, today, if you look around, you discover that um, as in Igbo, we are known for agriculture, tilling the ground, for survival, for sustenance. But today, we are hungry, and uh, most of us rely on food from the north before we can do anything. If there is uh, an issue in the north, when the north, north, the, north the northern farmers cough, here we catch cold. That is the reality of the moment. Why is it so that we can no longer feed ourselves? Well, as I said earlier, I appreciate you having me to discuss uh, this very issue. Uh, but I think that the best way to look at it is to go back a little bit into history. Okay. Because history will always equip us with the knowledge to understand the present and, of course, to be able to profile the solution uh, for the future. Um, let me take a, a departure from the period following the Civil War. Before the Civil War, we can comfortably say that people within our region, if I want to be particular, were self-sufficient in the area of agriculture because basically we weren't depending on imported food items you know including factory manufactured food items like indomie that you know that is rampant in many families today you know people were able to produce what they would eat and sell in fact i can tell you that i am a beneficiary of my of our farming you know from where my father made some money to pay for our school fees that shows that at that period, you know, people, Igbos, or people within this region were really farmers. But following, during the war, you know, uh, people in our region, particularly in the eastern region, lost grounds because of, you know, how that uh, war affected, you know, agriculture, especially the area of producing yam, corn, cassava, and, and what have you. So immediately the war ended. Uh, people were more interested in finding, you know, something to eat, and they could not find those things in the farms. I remember during the war when the soldiers would come to some the villages and they gather the cow, the chickens, they gather the cows, they gather the goats and all that, and they make away with them. So people had little or nothing to to to, to rely on, you know, immediately after the war. So people went out looking for jobs. People moved away. From from the homestead into the cities looking for jobs, any kind of job that will give them, even if it is one penny in those days or one cover. Uh, so I believe that that is where we have to take off from. So as a result of that, people now began to run away from farming because even when we're talking about uh, uh, culture, culture is evolutionary. So once there was such a break as a result of that war, it was difficult for people to return back you know, to the, to, the, to the rural areas, you know, to produce uh, some of these things that they were eating. And then people started uh, going into the schools. Some people went into the universities and secondary schools and what have you, which wasn't the case because the rate at which people were, 
you know, in these universities and secondary schools were very, was very, very less than what happened following the war. So I will say that that's probably where we put our, okay. place our hands on okay. as to how that happened. And once that culture caught on, okay. then you begin to see people now looking for, you know, what I will call the civil uh, uh, and public service related jobs. Okay. Uh, rather than going back to the farm, uh, at the point we are going to the farm was looked up, looked upon as something that is uh, um, uh, a cake. It was a cake, not and it was not uh, progressive. It's not something laborious. that people look uh, at with a sense of pride. You know, it's more like you're going to suffer. So these are, you know, few things that I can lay my hands on relating to how this thing started. Okay. And uh, it has continued that way, you know, unfortunately. And our people are not even helping. The government is not helping the matter. Yeah, I'm coming to that. You'll come uh, to that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, let me follow up immediately. Yes. You remember that uh, um, in the, in the mid-50s and early 60s, the former eastern region, which is still the southeast, yes. have today. Yes. You know, then it was presided over by Dr. Maya Opa. Yes. You know, was rated uh, as one of uh, the fastest growing economies in the world. And uh, their success was hinged on agriculture. Yes. And uh, basically focused on palm produce. Yes. Today, we still have palm produce. You know, we still have the same soil that was there then. We still have the same human beings, you know. Now, wh why is it, how do you relate the performance of our government today to the experience yeah. that we go cap in hand, if not money from Abuja, we can no longer survive. You know, how, so how do you assess government performance? Mm, I think you're making a very uh, important uh, point there. Uh, the government has not, you know, done uh, well in this area. If I were to gra grade the government in, in terms of the support for agriculture, I will give them, I will give them minus C. Because minus uh, minus C, C. <laughs> I will give them. I won't give them. I won't give them B, and I won't give the government C. I will give uh, uh, government minus, minus, C is minus. How many percent? Minus C will be something like maybe uh, uh, forty percent. Forty percent, if at all, it it has reached that level. Okay. During the time of MIO brother that you were mentioning, yeah. government put a lot of emphasis, and uh, um, not emphasis in terms of uh, the orientation that was on. You know, making people want to go into farming, but government, you know, contributed greatly in terms of the capital, you know, by even establishing uh, what we call uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, there's something that was called uh, um, a hard farm settlement and okay. what have you. Some of those things, you know, they created these uh, uh, palm plantations and what have you yeah. that you know employed. Uh, some of them are not skilled laborers, but still they were there doing the planting and harvesting. Mm -hmm. Government is not doing much as we see it today, and we can blame that on corruption because sometimes even government will hire people to go and work in, let's say, for example, the other palm, mm -hmm. and the capital that the, the government has brought out for them to even do something, they will share it before if it even gets into, into the field. Okay. So these are you know, some of the things that we can you know, uh, 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 lay our hands on as to what has really affected uh, agriculture in our area. And there is this social stigma. Mm -hmm. Maybe I mentioned it in the past. And there's this social, negative social stigma attached to farming. Our people do not see farming as something that, you know, props up their social, you know, mm -hmm. psychological mm -hmm. significance, mm -hmm. you know. People look at farming as something that people who do it are people who have nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. But it is not the, the case in even a civilized world. In civilized world, the people go into farming and uh, they do well, you know, and contribute to, to, to society. Unfortunately, it's not the case with us, but government has not done as much as it ought to do. Part of what government ought to do to increase the interest in the farming is the roads that lead to farms. Some of the roads yeah. are not motorable, and people get discouraged if they will produce something in the farms, but they will not have places to yeah. sell them. So we will put that blame on government, that government has not done what it ought to have done, you know, to encourage, encourage farming. It's okay. Thank you so much yes. for the point. I hope the people concerned are listening and uh, should take the necessary measure to reverse the trend. Okay, okay, uh, uh, Prof, again, you, 
You see, um, I don't know whether this is peculiar to our society, the Igbos. You know, uh, we, we have Igbo billionaires. We have a, lo a lot of them. And uh, it is not known that uh, any of them is into big time farming, even small time farming. I'm, I'm not aware of any Igbo billionaire or millionaire you can say, this is his farm, this is what he's doing. Instead, we invest uh, in um, real estate and hotel business, the in oil and gas and so many other types of business, except agriculture. And um, we have a very good quantity of, even though the Southeast is not big in terms of size, land mass, but uh, we still have uh, arable land. Yes. We still have areas we can cultivate. The Abakileke is there, the Anambra is there, they produce Ohaji. rice, Ohaji here, you know, even in Gopal, and yes. so many other places. There is virtually nowhere in the Southeast you can find arable land too. So what, what is this issue that makes our businessmen shy away from agriculture? Well, it may sound a little academic to say that um, uh, sometimes what motivates people into establishing businesses has to do with what we call the, um, the demand factor. We should ask ourselves this question. Mm. How much are our people well oriented into considering agriculture as something that they can engage in and they make fat money they make big money it seems to me that there's a little level of some degree of ignorance on the part of our people who make money for example if we use a word you know, as, as, a, as, our, as a point of departure here. Okay. A lot of people believe that uh, when it's a place where people come to spend money on weekends, and these people that establish these hotels are expecting to invest and make their money quickly. Yeah. But something relating to agriculture is not something that you go in this year, and by the end of the year, you've already started making, you've already started making money. So people want to have their turnover so fast that they think that if they go into hotel businesses so, or where it's considered the entertainment capital of the uh, of the world or, or maybe of Nigeria, people come from Abuja, come from Portacourt, come from Lagos, come from Onecha, Enugu, to enjoy themselves in Owe. Yeah. With the university and the women that we have around. So they think, you know, there is this high demand for entertainment. And therefore, they put their heads into a hotel. Unfortunately, some of these hotels don't you know, uh, st stand their grounds in terms of their status and uh, uh, the level of um, uh, what are, uh, sustenance, sustenance yeah. you know, yeah. over five years. Yeah. You see, see them start, you know, retrogressing in terms of what they present. Yeah. The concepts continue to change so rapidly. Mm. So I would tend to think that that is, a, ignorance is part of it, and this pension for wanting to get a turnover quick, quickly, quick, quick, quick. yeah, that is what pushed people there. Because if somebody wants to really get into an agriculture, mm. agriculture can be a, a five, ten years investment yeah. before it starts yielding, because some of, there are some of the crops that may not start bearing fruit until about five years. Yeah. Let's say somebody like who wants the, to like plant fruit crops. Yes, yeah, like fruit crops. Yeah. Except you want to, you, you know, plant something like granite. Yeah. You know, yeah. even plantain. You can't get plantain harvested under one year. No, no, you can't. Plantain, banana, you grow them in six months. Okay, I don't know that they can yeah. grow them. But yeah. what I'm saying is that people think that some of this is take time, like coconut. How long does it take coconut to start producing enough yeah. for them to make the kind of money yeah. that they will usually make? You know, if they build a hotel. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's what I think yeah. may be responsible for that. Yeah, but uh, like in the north, with the, all the foods is the same uh, uh, situation they go through that will take us back to the government you know government uh, assistance in the north uh, sorry to say that in the north uh, they take but they, they, they take advantage of government you know assistance in these areas of agriculture but i don't know, know how much that we are giving in this area and if you say how much government is giving, we still have to go back again talking about the accessibility of roads to some of these areas. So people who do farming here usually poultry or fishery, you know, which some people have now in their backyards. It's not the, the kind of farming we're talking quantum about. Farming. We're talking about something that is in quantum size that could uh, really impact upon, uh, you know, life in a, in a major way. And also, the more we produce them, maybe we can reduce the, the cost. The inflationary uh, uh, pressure on it yeah. will be yeah. a whole lot lower. Yeah. 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 Uh, you have a point, sir. Yeah. Now, now, let me take you to another issue entirely. Outside okay. family. You've, uh, you've uh, made your points. Yes. 
you know, it's a reason why we are not farming, why we are hungry. Yeah. You've explained that. Now, there is a, if you look around the society, you discover that we have a glut of marriageable women. Now, these women, most of them are above their prime. They are beautiful, very resourceful, wealthy, powerful, holding positions. And um, they, 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 what they lack is a husband. There are many of them out there. And uh, it gives cause for concern. When you look at the past, relating it to the present, in those days, it used to, it used to kind of, uh, you see, it, it brings mockery to see a young woman who is not married. Sometimes they use this word, uh, uh, you know, uh, those, those things are no longer, people no longer matter, uh, uh, no, it no longer bothers so, so many people again. So what, what do you think is responsible for, for this? And there are also uh, young men too who are also in need of uh, women, but they cannot uh, get wives. You know, so looking at the, 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 the women, what do you think is responsible for this glut of women? I think that uh, this will also probably take me back to the causes, going back to the end of the Civil War. Some of the things that caused women glut has to be traced back to, especially in our region, in this area. Okay. It has to take us back to you know, what happened to our men during the Civil War. What happened to our what, men? Yes, that is the majority of the men okay. did not make it back from the war fronts. A lot of men, young men, joined the military. Okay. When we talk about that, the Igbo, the Igbo area lost about 3.7 million people. Yeah. We want to think that at least 1.5 million of those that died during the war were men. men. So when the war ended, you know, there were less men out there okay. than women. And these people that were left, you know, moved into the cities, migrated away from the cities, and were looking for means of livelihood. Mm -hmm. And as they grew, you know, some of them went to school, began to have uh, higher expectations, and what have you. So you will continue to see that incrementally, the number of women continue to multiply as number of men, you know, continue to reduce. Let me give, for example, now, let yeah, us... Prof, but if I have to take you back, yeah. the, look at the time span, the time, in line, you know, between the, when the war ended and now. Yes, because this thing progressed over time. Okay. I wanted to look at that to mm -hmm. tell us where this discrepancy, this okay. imbalance okay, in the ratio of male-female mm -hmm. started. Okay. Yeah, but when men began to get, you know, go to school and begin to get jobs, but they are not materially, they are not materially strong enough to get married at a time. What it costs to get married in our region is becoming skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at the, the marriage list mm -hmm. in Ebola, I'm sorry that I'm, I don't know whether this is for our audience or for no, larger no. audience. Yeah. But if you look at the, the marriage rights in Ebola, it mm -hmm. is scary. A lot of men who would have ordinarily liked to marry will look at the marriage list and they're scared, you know. In some, in some areas. In, but, in some areas. But, but there has been intervention to bring it low. There has been intervention, but the question is that, is it intervention, oral intervention, or intervention in theory, has this thing materialized, you know, mm -hmm. because I, I was a witness to um, um, uh, 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 this... Uh, 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 traditional wedding somewhere last last month during the Christmas, and the list that was given was almost going to close to five hundred and something thousand naira. And these are men that probably they have not saved five hundred thousand naira in you know in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, this thing is becoming too too much for them. Another thing is that I think that most of our women yeah. are major causes of that because I tend to think that some of our women, mm -hmm. particularly our girls are in some kind of competition amongst themselves. They want to outdo each other when it comes to marriage ceremony. They want to outdo one another mm -hmm. in order to show off socially that they have married uh, maybe somebody that has made it. And in so doing, you know, they expect much out of some of these young men who are not in a position to do so because they are not. Let us look at even the rate of unemployment. When we look at the rate of unemployment, we can see people marry with money. 
People marry with money, and some of them. What do you mean, people marry with money? You have to marry because you have to pay the bride price. price. You okay. have to, you know, pay have, this. Okay, what it takes to. What it takes to get married. Yeah. yeah, but if this young man that want to get married, but what it is, what is involved is so astronomical, it tends to kill their interest, and to that extent, leaving many of these women, you know, hanging out, uh, not married. Another factor that I can look at is the fact that. You see, one of the, the one of the reasons for the glut is that there has been a tremendous uh, 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 pro a problem of my, uh, uh, immigration. A lot of our young men are, you know, migrating outside the country. Going, some of them want to go to Europe. Some of them want to go through the desert. Some of them want to go through the high seas, you know, or swim through the high seas and some of these risky boat voyages, and they are losing their lives. Look at the number of people that are also. In, in the military that are losing their lives. So the more we lose men, in, the more we lose men in their numbers, the more the ratio between female and, male, and the male will continue to bulljoin, you know. Okay. So that is part of the reason why we have so many, so many women, or the ratio of women over that of uh, men is a little, little higher. Okay, now, now now, do you also look at, uh, because I'm much more concerned on why they are not married, the issue of uh, the level of sophistication, education, and uh, do you think it's a factor? Well, it can be a, it can be a factor because I think that uh, there are some men, uh, you know, there's something that is called inferiority complex. Okay. Since women now feel that they need to be educated, in fact, even some of them, if their parents don't have money, they want to do whatever it is they, they, they want to do to get educated. And when a woman gets educated, our uh, expectations become a little higher. And there are a lot of men that are not as educated, and some of them, you know, feel somewhat inferior going to marry upper. Uh, because uh, some of them think that maybe, how can they control? Because this mentality that a man is supposed to control the wife yeah. is still there. It is still embedded in our culture that people think that women must be submissive. And there is this thinking that uh, women that are educated are not submissive. That has also effect on whether or not people will want to go and marry, in, including those that are, even have money yeah. to marry. But yeah. because they think that, you know, these women are too sophisticated for, for them, and it does discourage them at times. So what advice would you have for the women? Who are well, the advice I will have for them, and some people think that it's a controversial advice. I'm one of those that advocate for polygamy. I advocate for polygamy because I think that it can reduce okay, the... Okay, uh, Prof, let me hold you there, the issue of polygamy. Yes. Yeah, we may not have much time to talk. I think we may need to have another session to talk about the polygamy All right. as a, a solution to Yes. So this, but this before that, I want you to look at the consequences, the consequences of the glut of women we have in our society. The consequences of it, you know, are many. For example, it can it, it, it has created a lot of prostitution. That's a lot of prostitution that's going on. That women now, having gotten tired of waiting, are uh, either saying, "Hey, I can't live the rest of my life." you know, begging or going to my parents for food. Some of them will go into prostitution. Mm -hmm. Some of them have also decided to, you know, start some businesses. And to start those businesses, they need money. And how do they get this money to do this? So I think that that's one of the major consequences of, uh, of this. And some of them, you know, if we think back home, we find out that they have created a lot of problems within the family circle. A lot of them are now trooping into churches, you know, going to pray for you know, uh, miracle husbands, you know, and they've been exploited. Some of them will go and sow seed. Some of them buy olive oil, thinking that uh, it is something spiritual, yeah. that it is spiritual. So, I, but it is, I believe very strongly that it is not a spiritual thing. But uh, these pastors have also taken advantage of this mentality by continuing to reinforce this mentality of yeah. it is a spiritual yeah. thing or somebody is holding your future and your destiny. So these are some of the, the, the societal ills that the uh, lack of uh, 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 suitors, you know, have created, you know, in our society. Okay, that's so beautiful. Uh, well, we are, uh, this is where we draw the curtain, and um, I, we have to bring Prof here next time, uh, probably next week. Prof, hope you'll be available. Well, I will fi we'll find time for that. Yeah, because the issue of polygamy you want to raise is going to be very, very hard, because there is so much to talk about it. So, um, what is your final word for our 
society, for our people who have been shying away from agriculture? I think that uh, we need to go back to the root, to our roots. Uh, in spite of the fact that government has not done, you know, uh, measurably uh, enough uh, to encourage agriculture, but it should. But I think that our people should um, think in terms of the, this, 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 besides the fact that people might have, you know, other engagements like civil service job or public service and what have you. You know, somebody can still be a civil servant and still have a small farm that can help to contribute something, you know, to the family uh, living. Mm. So our people need to. There are times that people will leave during the uh, Easter period to go and do farming during the farming season. Yeah. And then after the farming season, they return back to, to town, you know, to do that. So I, I, I would like our people to take more seriously uh, this idea of going home, you know, to put something uh, uh, to plant something during the planting season than expect that everything that they eat or the family will eat, will, they will buy it from there. My very self, I do farm. I do farm. This is the third year that I've gone in. This is my fourth year, as a matter of fact, that I've, you know, planted, uh, you know, about uh, two plus of, uh, okay. of uh, land of uh, yams. I've done that. So okay. I think that uh, that will help. That will certainly help. Yeah, viewers, uh, you have heard it all from Professor Hilary Kemam. He has taken his time to X-ray why Ndibo no longer farm. And it's urging everyone to go back to the roots, to go back to the farm. Whatever you are doing, you can still spend some moments. At least farming at the subsistence level is yes. very, very important. Here we draw the curtain. And uh, remember to continue to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube platform. My name again is Afam Eti.